public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before I start, I want to confirm all the commissioners are here. Commissioner Biacco. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. I think you have to unmute because when we started up, everybody was muted. Commissioner Feldman? I'm here, Alex. Thank you. Great. Uh, Commissioner Tromka? Good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Boyle? I'm here. Good morning. Great. And I do want to note that this is the first public meeting in which, uh, in which Mary Boyle is participating as a commissioner. And I want to welcome you to the, your new role. I know that the commission will benefit from your extensive knowledge and experience. This morning, CPSC staff will brief the commission on CPSC's draft 2023 to 2026 strategic plan. The last time the commission approved a strategic plan was in 2017, covering the years 2018 through 2022. And a lot has changed over the last five years. The workplace has shifted dramatically as we learn very quickly how to operate virtually. We also have new leadership at the commission, and none of our current sitting commissioners were in these seats the last time the agency approved a strategic plan. The market cha place is changing as well, most notably with the continued expansion of e-commerce. We have new tools that can be used to protect consumers, including the potential to integrate machine learning and artificial intelligence more fully into our work. And that being said, many of our the challenges faced by our predecessors carry forward today. The agency's strategic plan establishes our vision and goals over a multi-year period. As a small, mission-driven agency with life or death literally on the line, that can be consumed in the day-to-day -day issues that come before us. Developing this plan enables us to think bigger picture and reflect on how best to achieve our mission. Today's briefing is one step in the congressionally mandated process for developing our strategic plan. There is more that needs to be done for this document is complete. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll have the opportunity to amend the staff draft, which will then be put out for public comment. This is an essential part of the process. We need to hear from the public regarding our priority setting and I'd welcome all comments. Once the common period closes, staff will review everything that we have received and incorporate comments into the document and the commission will have a second opportunity to consider the plan before it comes final. In a moment, I will turn this meeting over to the staff so that they can brief us. Once we've completed, they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minute rounds to ask questions to the staff with multiple rounds if necessary. Briefing us today will be Jason Levine, CPSC Executive Director. I know this also marks his first meeting as a uh, public meeting as executive director, and he too brings much experience, expertise, and passion to the commission. Uh, he is joined by James Baker, chief financial officer, Dwayne Ray, deputy executive director for operations, Dwayne Boniface, assistant executive director, Rob Kay, director compliance field operation, Pamela Springs, Director of Communications, and as always, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, CPSC's Secretary. With that, I'd like to turn this over to Mr. Levine for the briefing. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Good morning to all the commissioners. Um, if we could get the slide deck up, uh, we'll jump right into it. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go right to our next slide, uh, slide number two, and talk about the strategic plan uh, and the process uh, and the document that uh, that everyone should have uh, with them, at least uh, if not in front of you, um, close by. So uh, strategic plans, as many of you know, are statutorily required by Congress under GIPRA, uh, and as well, they're detailed uh, with some guidance in uh, the OMB Circular A11. On a normal course of business, federal agencies submit their plans every four years, beginning with a new term of an administration, uh, and they're generally published the year after. Uh, due to uh, our lack of a uh, chief executive officer newly confirmed last year, uh, 
when we were supposed to start our process, which would have made it a 2022 to 26 strategic plan. Today, we are looking at a draft version of the 23 to 26 strategic plan. Um, but we did make sure to notify uh, Congress and OMB both in August of 21 and March of 22 of our plan for moving forward in an off cycle uh, style with respect to the strategic plan. Uh, next slide, please. So a little background on our draft strategic plan specifically. Um, it, as you as you know, reflects the agency's mission, vision, long-term strategic goals and objectives, uh, as well as strategies, approaches, use, monitor progress. I think that's amongst the most important pieces of it is that it lays out uh, at an enterprise level um, the the concepts and and how we will move forward uh, over a four year or five year. This in this instance, a four year period. Uh, as we put together the various annualized documents that the commission uh, approves every year. The framework itself is a four tiered uh, setup. So strategic goals, strategic objectives, strategies, and initiatives. And each at each layer, they get a little more detailed uh, than the one before it. Next slide, please. So uh, here, uh, this lays out actually three um, three different pieces uh, of, of the strategic plan, uh, mission, vision, and those overarching sort of pillars of the strategic plan, the goals one through four. Um, not going to read them to you. Uh, you can all see them for yourselves, but I will note uh, some high level items that have changed from the previous plan. Uh, the, the new version has a, a slightly different mission statement, still remains in plain English. We'll talk about that in a second, but is, is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, one new strategic goal out of the four strategic goals, and there are five new strategic objectives out of a total of 14 spread throughout the document. Um, next slide, please. So, as mentioned, uh, the the mission language itself has changed uh, a little bit, remaining again in that plain English style, uh, but being a little bit more specific uh, and nuanced than the previous version, which was keep consume, keeping consumers safe, uh, it is now protecting the public from unsafe consumer products as this overarching uh, mission concept. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, Strategic goal one. Uh, so the main item I would note here uh, is that we have shifted uh, goals two, three, and four from the previous strategic plan have been moved up to goals one, two, and three uh, in this strategic plan. And there have been obviously some tweaks within that as well. Uh, but generally speaking, the 23 to 26 strategic plan builds on the framework of the, the previous strategic plan so that much of the, the the foundation remains similar, familiar feeling, though there have been uh, changes in an attempt to um, find places where things can be improved, made more robust uh, and more specific, uh, both with respect to the actual activity uh, that is contemplated, but also with respect to measurement uh, and how we're going to do that. Um, the, um, the the goal, sorry, the, the lead office for uh, for strategic goal one prevent uh, is the Office of Hazard Reduction. Contributing offices uh, include import surveillance and our international programs. I would note throughout uh, while we highlight and there are offices that take the lead for each specific goal uh, because it's important that. You know, there, there is an office that is uh, tasked with rounding up the information, particularly when we get to the measurement piece. Uh, it's hard to suggest that any of these goals are only within one office and, and they do have a um, uh, across the agency. Uh, there, there's significant input from from all the offices and, and we'll get to that a little bit more when we talk particularly about goal four. Next slide, please. Okay. So, um, I'm sure my notes are matching up. Okay, so here uh, in Strategic Objective 1.1, 1 .1, uh, what you'll see is a highlighted change emphasizing the importance of timeliness and identifying hazards. So when we talk about prevent, 
when we talk about our hazard office hazard reduction, this is you know an area where we're thinking about preventing the hazard, ideally, you know, at, at the source, as it were, uh, which is why we're talking about in, in the rule making space or the international space, the import space, trying to stop it before it gets into consumers' hands and trying to do that in a in as timely manner as possible. Uh, in 1.2, you'll note a change from the previous uh, strat plan, strategic plan uh, highlighting the criticality of effective safety standards. Um, those, those seemed worth highlighting. You'll note 1.3 has remained uh, the same because we remain to think it's it's useful in how we do what we're doing. Next slide. Okay. Uh, strategic goal two uh, here, what we've done is, is in an effort to emphasize the importance of being proactive. Uh, the terminology has changed from response to address. Um, and as you can also see, uh, we've, we've changed the, we've added the concept of, and making sure we are talking about it in a fast and effective manner. Again, it's not to say that we weren't in a fast, effective manner previously, but it's really emphasizing the you know, language emphasizes what's important. And we're continuing to do that uh, in, in this goal here. Uh, the lead lead office here is going to be our uh, office of compliance. Contributing offices are including hazard reduction and international programs. Next slide, please. Again, getting a little bit deeper into the details of strategic goal two, you'll note some changes throughout here. Uh, some that I would highlight, uh, certainly probably the one I'd highlight the most would be strategic objective 2.4, which is a brand new strategic objective within this office, uh, within this goal uh, that talks about how we monitor post recall activity. Uh, you know, a lot of our work, a lot of our emphasis goes to obviously uh, if a product, uh, whether through a defect or a regulatory uh, circumstance has reached the marketplace, has reached consumers. We want to, a lot of work goes into getting that product out of consumers' hands, out of the marketplace. But what are firms doing after that recall takes place to help continue to, whether it be get the word to consumers, uh, fulfill any uh, obligations that they have uh, agreed to with the commission? Uh, so that's 2.4 reflects this new, uh, this new objective. Uh, and the importance of the need to make sure that um, the recall process doesn't end with the announcement of the recall. Next slide. Strategic goal three, communicate. Uh, you know, this would be another example where uh, perhaps uh, the, the one strategic goal that is literally synonymous with one of our offices, the office of communication, and yet again, it's just an example where uh, the entire uh, agency is is often involved in trying to make sure we're fulfilling uh, the the goal here of communicating actionable information about consumer product safety quickly and effectively. Uh, one note on the change from useful to actionable here, with a real emphasis on the the need to get information into consumers' hands upon which they can act, uh, whether that be recall information, whether that be information in the context of an information uh, and education campaign. Uh, with a real desire, uh, where possible, uh, not only to, to reach consumers again in that quick and effective manner, but in a way in which they can act on on, on receipt of that information. Uh, contributing offices, in addition, uh, of course, to the office communication leading uh, this effort, uh, small business ombudsman, consumer ombudsman, uh, international program, and office of general counsel, all are uh, contributing offices, uh, as noted in the plan itself. To strategic goal three. Next slide, please. Uh, as you'll note in, in the three strategic objectives underneath strategic goal three, not only is that change to actionable present throughout, uh, but also the, the emphasis on diverse audiences, reaching diverse audiences, that variety of diverse audiences and underserved communities as well. Um, again, I think it's something that uh, is is a real renewed emphasis throughout everything we're doing, and, and it's reflected here uh, specifically within strategic goal three. Next slide, please. Goal four support. So this is a new strategic uh, goal for uh, for the agency. It previously 
Uh, some of these ideas were captured in 2018 to 22 plan as a workforce, uh, but this is a, um, a total sort of rethink of, of how we describe the activities of a large swath uh, of, of the folks here at the agency and the offices and uh, the work that they do every day to support all the things we just talked about. Uh, and so this covers, um, as noted on the slide, not just our workforce, but also our financial management, ethics and government, information technology, uh, where we're talking about um, the use of agency resources. We're talking about information technology, um, ethics. We're talking about all these different pieces uh, have now been set out in a way that both highlights and raises the profile, quite frankly, of these vital uh, pieces of the agency, but also sets out performance measures uh, within within the concept of the strategic plan that uh, had not previously been there because um, again having those that emphasis and that that raised profile also allows uh, and encourages the opportunity to measure um, in ways that we can uh, the, the vital work that these folks do these offices do to support all of the work of the agency so as you might expect there are more lead offices for, for goal four than anything else uh, than any of the other strategic goals so this would include uh, resource management, financial management, office general counsel, uh, and the office of information technology with contributing offices, including the office of equal employment, opportunity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Is that the end? Next slide. Oh, oh and I should note there weren't any changes from the previous one uh, in that slide because there was no previous. Uh, similar support goal in uh, the 2018 to 2022 version. Uh, so, in 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 wrapping and wrapping this up in terms of um, process and logistics, uh, as has been previously announced, there will be a commission decisional vote um, on this draft plan on August 10th. Uh, following a commission approval of a strategic plan, it will go out for a 30 day comment period. Uh, to hear from the public outside sta external stakeholders uh, at that point in time, staff will collect review and uh, incorporate stakeholder input into a revised version of this draft plan, uh, present it back to the commission for review and eventual approval. The, um, after that point in time, after the commission has, has approved it, we'll be adding in the pictures uh, that, uh, are so sort of recognizable from, from our strategic plans in the past. Uh, and then we will be submitting it, the plan is concurrently with our fiscal 2024 performance budget request to Congress, which historically has been early in February, although uh, one would note uh, in previous years, including this year, it can be uh, far later in the calendar year into March, sometimes late March, uh, which is something that is, uh, not dictated uh, by any decision of the commission. So, uh, in terms of that piece of it, that is, I believe, our last. Oh, there's this white slide. Um, so that's our last uh, slide. Thank you so much for your attention. We stand ready for questions about the strategic plan, and thank you for letting us talk about it today. Thank you, Mr. Levine. So at this point in time, we'll turn to questions from the commission. As I said, uh, doing 10 minutes uh, for each commissioner with multiple rounds if necessary. Um, Dan, I believe that the slide deck is still up on the screen. If you could pull that off and we can move to uh, the individuals, I'd appreciate it. Um, so I will start with myself, recognize myself for, for 10 minutes. Um, you know, first of all, thank you very much to the staff for putting together this um, uh, draft strategic plan for the commission's consideration. Uh, many of the elements of the work new workforce goal in the strategic plan, um, or the the workforce goal in the past strategic plan, have been incorporated on the support goal. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit, Mr. Levine, on the rationale behind the change and how the support goal is different than the workforce goal for previous um, strategic plans. Sure, thank you for the question. I, I think probably it's best, the, the best way to describe it is it does a far better job of um, 
capturing the variety of support administrative and otherwise that uh, goes on in the offices mentioned uh, within the goal um, that had not previously necessarily been highlighted. I think they had sort of been sprinkled, let's say, through, throughout strategic plans, but they hadn't been sort of given standalone um, opportunities to really be focused on. And uh, so whether we're talking about, um, you know, internal controls and financial management or some of the very important work that information technology uh, is undertaking uh, and on and on the these, you know, these are really the backbone administrative uh, work of uh, that helps everyone else um, that sometimes gets gets the, the headlines uh, at do our work. Uh, and so I think, it, you know, we think it's important to, to make sure we highlight that and then also have that opportunity to, sort of to, to have the measurement piece. Uh, and so the, the goal was to, to bring it forth in, in a different way than we had previously. And uh, hence, number four. Yeah, I appreciate that. I do think number of the internal controls and, um, you know, focusing on the ethics makes a lot of sense along with being able to figure out how to. Uh, maintain and uh, attract strong talent to the agency. I mean, uh, the, the staff is the core of what we do. It's not the commissioners, to be honest. Um, it is people who are actually doing the work. So um, I do think that is an important goal overall. Uh, I appreciate the, the greater emphasis also on enforcement, recall effectiveness, and rulemaking strategic plan. Um, can you expand on how the key performance measures track the increased focus? Sure, and, and thanks for the question again. The there's a number of ways, both sort of at the strategy level and the initiative level, um, within the key performance measures specifically, where the draft plan has increased focus on on these different areas. Um, you know, at, at sort of the most um, basic level, you know, elevating prevent uh, to that first goal spot uh, it, it demonstrates the need. You know that that's our you know. First and foremost, we're going out to try and prevent hazardous products from reaching consumers in the first place. And sort of that that shift just sort of both visually and in order of priority, uh, I think demonstrates that. But more specifically, when we talk about the actual measurements, uh, there's three that I would highlight. There's some others, but three that I would uh, highlight right away. One would be uh, strategic objective 1.2 includes an addition of a measure which emphasizes the need to conduct timely inspections of repeat offenders. Uh, strategic objective 2.2 has key performance measures that track the increased focus on minimizing further further exposure to hazardous consumer products through our enforcement actions. Uh, and, and brand new strategic objective 2.4 includes an entirely new measure uh, based on that new objective, uh, which involves monitoring post recall activity by firms. The measure itself is intended to assist uh, CPSC to identify the need for additional compliance enforcement or communications activities uh, in that post recall period. So, I, you know, I think it's, it's really an attempt to, to find ways, not only to talk about these things, of course, but to emphasize moving them forward in, in a measurable manner. And that makes sense. Um, one other change that I wanted to get a little bit more information on really is in the communications goals part of the strategic plan. And that is to hone in on the addition of the word actionable to communicating actionable information to the public. Um, I want to ask, how is this different than previous uh, plans and how will this inform um, your communication strategies? And sure, so well, I, well, I'm happy to talk about anything like this. I, I think probably Pam Springs might be in a better our director of communications. Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. I was going to direct it to Pam. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, Ms. Springs. Thank, thank thanks you. so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for the question. I think, you know, I think what we, my goal is to go beyond just pushing out recall information safety alerts. That's very important. Um, but what we also want to do is to provide consumers with information to keep themselves and I'm going to use the word empower themselves to, to stay safe in their homes with regular, you know, products. So, for example, um, you know, we've got the anchor it campaign, but there may be some people for whatever reason are unable to anchor their their furniture. 
um, but we can still provide them with information to, to keep themselves safe. For example, you know, keep items that may be attractive to young kids away from edges so they aren't, you know, they aren't uh, prompted to try and reach for it. So it's, it's providing that kind of actionable information, not just pushing out information, but giving consumers, um, you know, a call to action, something that they can do um, to really protect themselves and in some ways help us protect them through uh, going to saferproducts.gov and reporting their own uh, product hazard experiences and potentially helping other people. So that's really where actionable comes from, giving consumers something that they can do to keep themselves safe. Thank you. And one more question for you. How does the agency plan uh, as part of the strategic plan to reach out to diverse audiences, including vulnerable and underserved communities? Yeah, that that's very important to me, and, and thank you again for that for that question. Um, you know, we want to meet audiences where they are. So, just at a high level, we want to uh, we want to drive mark, micro targeting uh, strategies and tactics. Um, we want to leverage all media platforms. Not everybody's on the internet. Not everybody reads newspapers. We want to leverage all platforms to reach all of our communities. So, for example, some of that's actually already going on. We've got billboards in indigenous communities um, to provide safety information because, um, you know, uh, we, we were instructed that that's where um, those communities best receive that information. So, you know, over the next year, we'll be doing um, lots more of that, reaching out on mobile, reaching out on radio. Um, needless to say, the Spanish language um, is very important. So, you know, broadly speaking, meeting audiences where they were, leveraging all platforms, and micro-targeting where, um, where necessary. Also, sorry, um, pursuing collaborations with trusted voices in communities, um, as well as with state and local uh, agencies that can help us socialize safety messaging. Thank you very much. I uh, you know my time is just about over, so I am going to turn to Commissioner Biacco. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to everyone who has presented, particularly Mr. Levine um, and, and Ms. Springs. I appreciate your input and welcome to Mary Boyle, um, our first, um, our newest commissioner um, at our first public meeting. So welcome. Um, glad to have you here. So I have, um, I have a couple overarching questions, um, Jason, for, for you. And you mentioned, you mentioned the different mission statement, which I definitely like better. And there are statements throughout the uh, the plan, but the one nit, I guess, it's not really a nit. It's the the term that we tend to use a lot is is unsafe, and that is not in our statute as far as the agency's mission. The mission is to protect consumers from the unris unreasonable risk, right, of harm from consumer products. So I would like to see throughout this um, plan uh, those those adjustments made because this brings me to my my next point some of these terms like unsafe um, are subjective and we have many terms throughout the plan that are i mean we can all sit around and say okay i know what unsafe means or i know what timely means but they're not really defined and i think that's important for us to do and that brings me to my question about how are we planning on defining some of these terms you know, hazardous is another one that I saw in strategic goal number one. Um, you know, hazardous means a lot to a lot of different people. It's defined differently in different parts of our statute. I mean, do we have any way to actually um, put a finer uh, finer point on some of these key terms? Sure. So, th thank you so much for the question. And, and I would note that the the vision um, statement itself is specifically nation free from unreasonable risks of injury and death from consumer products. So it's certainly uh, a recognition of that statutory uh, charge. Um, I think, you know, using terms and strategic plans again, remember are, are, are designed to be at an enterprise level, uh, like uh, prevent hazardous products from reaching consumers, uh, address hazardous consumer products. I mean, you're right that that's going to vary depending upon exactly what the circumstances are and the product is. But I think it's a recognition of, of the steps that we go through uh, on a technical side to evaluate um, a given product. And so that may be a circumstance where there's an existing regulation uh, that has by commission 
um, vote and, and pub publication in the, in the Federal Register or uh, Code of Code of Federal uh, Regulations deemed essentially something to be hazardous, and, and hence we are, are are working to get it off, you know, out of the marketplace. There are going to be other circumstances where it's more of a defect sort of question, and we're going to have to try and determine through uh, the technical uh, work that we do in hazard reduction to test and, and determine whether something is hazardous in the context in which the product is, is being used. So I, I, I think I'm not sure that I would use the term subjective personally, but I do think um, it's going to vary based on uh, the circumstances. Has there been any discussion of having um, any type of glossary to define the terms as used in the strategic plan, or is that something that uh, has been dismissed? Or it's just a bad idea. It's just a question that I had as I was listening to you speak. Sure, I, I'm not. To be honest, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that when we get more, um, when we get to the operating plan and, and the budget request um, documents, you know, that that is another level of specificity that we do um, lay out in terms of some of these priorities. But in terms of uh, definitions of words. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have to get back to you. I think our, our goal is to get a plain language uh, as sort of, you know, sort of the goal in, in the strategic plan and then get down to that that more definitive specific level in these more annualized um, directional documents. Okay, so I'm going to beat this dead horse just a little bit more um, in uh, looking at the key performance measures. You know, a lot sure. of things have in here percentage of percentage of number of, I mean, but it doesn't the performance measures don't set out what those percentages are, or what those number goals are. Um, I just wanted to get your input on that. Sure, and thank you for that. And I, and I think this is a, a, a common question uh, for the strategic plan. Um, so you asked it first, but others might be thinking it as well. Uh, so the strategic plan lays out the, um, the key measures over the course of the period of time covered by the strategic plan, in this instance, fiscal 23 to 26, it's then those annualized documents I mentioned, the operating plan and the budget, where each of these measures will then have specific numbers attached to them. Um, so they might vary from year to year based on previous year's performance, uh, resources, uh, priorities in terms of uh, where the commission might go in a given year. So if a number, let's say, of imported products uh, to be uh, examined is 40,000 in a given year, it might be less or more the following year, uh, depending upon commission direction. Okay, that, that's helpful, actually. Thank you very much. Um, One of the things that I, I've been thinking about recently is, um, you know, we have saferproducts.gov for people to report their experiences with products. Um, have we talked about, and maybe it's not appropriate for the strategic plan, although I think it could be um, some type of program where um, members of the community can report when they see they're on the line, they're about to buy something and they see a banned product, because I think it would help um, have to have something other than saferproducts.gov for for people or stakeholders, if you will, to report into us because you know we can't monitor every possible site at every possible time. So, do we have any plans for for something like that? Um, I, we, certainly, something that that has been um, I think discussed. I, I know that you've mentioned it uh, before, and I think uh, we're going to try and figure out the best way to accomplish this. I think certainly saferproducts.gov is one place uh, to receive information uh, from consumers, but you know, we should be open. Uh, the hotline is, is another place uh, and, and general sort of incoming information uh, from via email that, that the commission receives. Um, but, you know, it is sort of to our benefit to find ways to receive in, important information like that from consumers. At, at the same time, you also need to be mindful of trying to brand something in a way that so that people know where to go and find it. So I, I think that's the balance we're trying to strike, but you know, look forward to trying to figure that out. Yeah, saferproducts.gov, I'm still not seeing it as a user-friendly site. And to have somebody, you know, I, I take these calls all the time, as I'm sure lots of us take these calls where somebody picks up the phone and says, hey, commissioner or, you know, a staff member, I see this, I'm, I'm going to buy this, and I see this product has been banned for five years, why is it still up there? And, you know, I, I'll pass that along, we all pass it along, but we really don't have a channel for that. And saferproducts.gov, I just don't think 
it's intuitive, first of all, to report something like that on saferproducts.gov. And then secondly, it's saferproducts.gov is still very unuser friendly in, in my humble opinion. So um, I do think that should be made part of the strategic plan. I think it's important, uh, especially for our limited resources to have something like that. Um, uh, the talent section and the workforce section, I think, is is a is a nice addition. Talent is key. Um, I am looking forward to. I know we're a little down in headcount, so I'm looking forward to putting that into place. And I do have some questions about post recall, but I think um, I'll, I'll hold those for now. And uh, I think my time's about up, and I can follow up with you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bianco. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Levine, for that presentation. Uh, just to, to to start off, uh, I, I appreciate all the questions that my colleagues have been asking. I think that's thoughtful. Uh, I, I very much agree with uh, Commissioner Biaco that uh, what what is the language that's included in the strategic strategic plan should mirror uh, our statutory directive, uh, just so that we're not introducing. Uh, you know, extraneous ambiguity into uh, our, our, our various documents across the board. I think that consistency is important because it lends itself better, I think, uh, to clarity. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to get to my questions. Uh, and, and the chairman mentioned that, uh, that that staff is the core of this agency, and I, I agree with that. I, I believe in particular uh, that with a planning document like this, an important planning document uh, like the one we're considering today, uh, we all have a role to play, and we should be hearing from all employees uh, agency wide. I, I know that when uh, the commission developed its strategic plan uh, the last time, which was uh, the original strategic plan at CPSC, uh, this process involved an agency wide canvas. Uh, I think that we should be uh, seeking input from the frontline staff uh, to the seventh floor and everybody in between uh, when when dealing with something like this. Uh, and to that end, uh, I'm currently in Los Angeles, so I apologize for the spotty Wi-Fi uh, if that ever becomes an issue. Uh, uh, but I'm here with my office where we had an opportunity to, to meet with our import surveillance team at uh, LAX uh, in the ports of LA and Long Beach. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, because of the efforts that the commission uh, took back uh, when we considered uh, our current operating plan, uh, that this import surveillance team uh, is more than doubled in size. And working together with CP, uh, C, CBP, we're interdicting now uh, uh, more dangerous products from entering domestic commerce. Uh, but in uh, the, the tour that we took yesterday, we had an opportunity to sit down with these frontline workers uh, and to, to have them share their thoughts about uh, what's working, what isn't, uh, where the, the commission should be headed. And, and that kind of feedback uh, is always invaluable. Uh, so with that in mind, Mr. Levina, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, how this plan was developed and specifically uh, who was uh, consulted. I, I understand that uh, this was a very collaborative process uh, the first time. So I, I do have some questions about uh, what your plan of attack has been. Sure, no, I, I appreciate that question and, and, and glad to hear that uh, it has been a, a, a good experience uh, out at our ports in LA and Long Beach. Um, our folks at the ports and in the field are, you know, in many ways, the face of the agency. So I'm glad to hear and do such important work. So glad to hear that's been going well. Um, with respect to development of, of the draft plan before you, the work started uh, last fall um, after, uh, after confirmation uh, of the chair um, with a, a general consultation uh, with a, a planning committee. Uh, that consisted of a variety of staffers um, and a general consensus internally, at, admittedly at, at a leadership and a management level to base this strategic plan on the existing plan. I, I think it's important to note um, the, the, the most recent, the, the current plan, as it were, that, that we're operating under uh, was a rewrite of the original strategic plan uh, that was done, I want to say somewhere around 2011 or 2012. Um, and so the, the the thought was well this was a this was a rewrite um, and fundamentally was uh, something that people felt comfortable was uh, efficient uh, in, in achieving the, the long term goals and um, did not necessitate a complete rewrite because we were already off cycle a little bit um, with sort of where we were in the cycle so the the 
the consultation with staff went through um, uh, man, leadership uh, of the variety of offices with a real desire to include more offices uh, than had previously been involved, as you see uh, in strategic, the existence of strategic goal four, uh, which then led to a um, the continued development uh, followed by uh, the priorities hearing in April, uh, which also helped inform the document in front of us. It's, it's, as as you all know, uh, where you know the community, the stakeholders can come in and, and talk about their thoughts on our priorities. Um, and then it you know went back through you know the wash of of uh, the rewriting uh, financial management heads the uh, the the bringing together of the document itself. Uh, but again, with a regular consultation with all the variety of offices that are uh, impacted by the strategic plan. So it, it, it was not an agency wide survey, certainly, but it was something that was developed in consultation with all of the offices, uh, you know, at, at a staff level uh, to present the document in front of you. Okay, I appreciate that answer. Uh, I have no further questions at this time. We're still continuing to review. Uh, the, the slide deck that you put together today and, and also the, uh, the underlying uh, language of the plan itself. Uh, I do appreciate the, the, the work that you've done. I, I do wish that this process had been more inclusive of uh, uh, folks other than just, uh, you know, senior agency le uh, uh, leadership at a, uh, a planning committee stage, but in fact, included a, a you know, agency wide canvas. Uh, but, uh, but, but again, we're, we're still reviewing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, as we think through this strategic plan, I'd like to take a little time to reflect back on where this process has taken us in the. So, how would you describe our biggest achievements and successes and meeting goals under the? 20? <laughs> I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit there, so I'm not sure what the end of that question was. The, the end of that question was, how would you describe our biggest achievements and successes in meeting goals that we set under the 2018 plan? Um, well, I mean, that's an interesting question because I think the, um, the, the unusual factor uh, when we look at the strategic plan is um, any strategic plan, you know, ours or other agencies is that because the individual measures aren't built in to the plan itself, as we talked about sort of the annualizing of those specific measures. Um, it's hard to sort of specifically benchmark. Did we meet or not meet them specifically? Because the, the, the numbers themselves, the actual mark you're shooting for changes annually. That said, um, I certainly think a, a lot of the. The previous, or I guess current. Plan uh, had a real focus on um, developing a um, a, a more uh, thorough recognition uh, of the the need to address things like e-commerce, the, of the need to put in place plans, even you know just develop them uh, for uh, areas that the agency had not necessarily previously really focused on, um, and the uh, in the data gathering space. Uh, and, and, and the enforcement space. And, and I think it did a good job of sort of really making that transition for us uh, from a period of time sort of just post CPSIA, uh, where the agency was, was thrust upon a, a whole host of, of new requirements and, and new areas to, to take on and get us sort of to now that's part and parcel of the work that we do. We need to build up plans and make sure we're implementing all of that. And now I think what you have before you is that next step, that strategic plan that's going to take us moving forward um, to the new reality in which we live, that CPSIA authorities are built in and baked into what we do, and how are we addressing that moving forward, the e-commerce piece, and our recognition of our new, new, the new world in which we live uh, from both an e-commerce and an IT space. Um, so I don't know that I have a specific, we did this and didn't do that, but I think it's more of a, a sense of, they built a pretty good foundation. Now it's time for us to, to start furnishing the house and make sure it's it's doing what it should do. Yeah, and I think you're right that the e-commerce is definitely an area that the agency made great strides in under under that last period of strategic planning. Um, but you know, I do think it's important if we're going to go through this exercise, which obviously we, we we have to go through this exercise. 
that we look back at the end and and measure up those year to year goals that fit within the strategic plan and, and see how we did. And I, I hope we do that four years from now and see how far we've come. Um, what about areas that we fell short in meeting goals under the 2018 plan? Well, I, I mean, again, I think, and, and by the way, I'd, I'd be remiss in saying that in, in not not noting, you know, there were things that we put in there, like making sure we're dealing with, we're starting to think about AI and machine learning and um, the, the ideas of how to um, uh, really address hazards in a way that we hadn't sort of significantly taken on before. Um, but to your point of what we missed, again, I think, um, because yeah, we don't measure it from year to year, it's hard to say. We did sorry, we do measure it from year to year. We don't measure it within the context of the strategic plan. Um, what we can say, and I think a better way of thinking about it is in circumstances where things look uh, as if we needed to um, uh, essentially keep the same goal because we're still moving forward in a way that requires an implementation of a plan, that means sort of all right, we developed it. Now we have to implement it. Maybe there are areas, and I need to go back, and, and I'm happy to do this one by one, but areas where we thought maybe we'd be able to develop and implement a plan in a four or five year period uh, where we developed and we hadn't really had a chance to do that implementation. Um, but I need to go back step by step. But again, it's this is more of a direction for us to build in those year by year goals in our operating plan and budgets uh, as opposed to measuring against the strategic plan itself, which is why it's such an excellent exercise to regularly refresh it. Yeah, and, and I would really love to have that conversation with you within the next week um, about those those things that you were talking about that we didn't have time to implement and, and we have put them back in this plan so we can finish that job. So I'd like to understand what those are and, and why we are where we are on those. Um, you know, I think one tremendously positive improvement in this plan over the previous one is the inclusion of a focus on deterrence as a tool that we can use to prevent firms from bringing dangerous products to market and, and from, from keeping those products on the market. Um, for example, we explicitly mentioned using civil penalties and criminal pen penalties everywhere they're appropriate. Can you explain how our approach to using deterrence will be different from the past if we adopt this plan? Well, I, I mean, I think there's uh, a real recognition of the um, of the value of deterrence <laughs> in the use of civil penalty authority, um, and uh, that that is something, and even to the extent criminal uh, referrals need to be made uh, in in certain unusual circumstances, um, that is not to say that the commission had previously never undertaken civil penalties, um, but by putting it front and center within the strategic plan context, uh, it highlights the, um, the value of the tool and the importance uh, of the tool um, should the commission adopt the plan uh, to the commission. Uh, and so, I mean, I think it's uh, a recognition that recalls are intended to uh, get that hazardous, uh, unreasonable, unreasonably risky product uh, out of the hands of consumers. Um, but the civil penalties, when we are talking about them, uh, particularly involving uh, lateness uh, or other violations that lead to a civil penalty circumstance, um, aren't you know the recall isn't 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 alone going to necessarily deter uh, that behavior and the criminal and the civil penalty does allow for that um, and ideally sends a message to other similarly situated firms um, that the commission. Uh, believes that this is important enough to take the time to make sure that uh, everyone knows. And I think that's an important distinction you made. So to deter this company from, from the same bad acts again, but also to, to let everybody else know so that they're deterred from, from taking similar actions with their products. Um, so I've got several <clears throat> questions about how we approach chronic hazards in this plan. And I think the first one is just a, a point of clarification but the description of our approach to chronic hazards has a focus on new products and new uses of older products. And I think that just seems to be lead in language, but, but, you know, cause we're learning that new information all the time about existing hazards in our home, PFAS, NOFRs are two examples out of many that, that come to mind. Uh, so we can find out in the future that we've been living with chronic hazards and products we're using the same way all along. And, and I think that the wording gives the impression or it could give the impression that we're focused on new products and new uses. 
I have to imagine if that's my reading, that's a, that's an unintentional consequence there, right? But I just wanted to confirm that. I would think so. I mean, I would need to look at, at the language specifically, but I, I mean, I think, you know, look, the, the state of science knowledge is always going to continue to evolve. And so what may have previously been seen as an acute hazard turns out not to be, but turns out to be a chronic hazard. And so while that can be a new product, it can also be a newly understood chronic hazard in an old product. Um, and so okay. I think that's the goal of, of the, the description. Um, and, you know, I think the approach that the staff takes. Okay, well, that, that's good. Cause you know, if, if we find out this has, you know, chemical X in this coffee mug that I've had for 10 years, we don't know it's dangerous today. We find out it's dangerous tomorrow. We're not saying that we're going to ignore that. Uh, and I just want to make sure. No, so it certainly should not be read that way because that's certainly not going to be the the, the, the approach. Excellent. Um, and, and then suppose that 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 happens. So, or, or suppose that we want to, you know, add to the operating plan next year a direction to more quickly address several specific emerging chronic hazards. There's nothing in this document that would impede our ability to move quickly in addressing those hazards. Is there? Uh, th there shouldn't be. Again, the, the, the not there's no specific product. Um, uh, Listed uh, in a strategic plan, because that's not uh, really the, the, the goal of the of the plan itself. It's to allow uh, a an overarching enterprise wide framework for how to approach it. Um, but the, the decisions as to what to uh, go ahead and enforce uh, or regulate um, or research or any of those different pieces is going to be made on an annual basis and at the, at the commission level based on. Um, policy decisions, available resources, science, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, there, there shouldn't be anything in here that impedes um, anything, of course, other than, I guess, jurisdiction. Okay, I'll just ask one last question on chronic hazards, then I'll wrap up this this segment here. Uh, the draft plan didn't carry forward um, an initiative that was in the 2018 plan to enhance our coordination with relevant federal agencies to address chronic hazards. Um, you know. I think maybe this could tie into what you were talking about before, but but can you explain why that coordination uh, initiative wasn't carried forward? Um, I would need to go back and take a look at, at exactly the, the the change and um, whether it's um, uh, what I think. I want to double check this, but I think that got moved, not re not removed. So I think it's now uh, a recognition. I believe that's now. Um, I want to say an external uh, external factors, I think, is now. So I think it's still there. Uh, we'll go back and check. But I'm pretty sure that coordination level, in fact, I remember reading about state and federal coordination on chronic hazards. Um, so we'll just need to find it and locate it. But if not, we'll get back to you. But uh, we'll certainly, you know, particularly because of the size of, uh, of our of our ability, of our of the agency and our resources, uh, we are going to continue to have to work. Uh, with our federal partners uh, on on these issues because they are often so much bigger than us, and uh, quite frankly, you know, our resources are limited in trying to get after some of the science uh, in a way that uh, we couldn't do alone. So, uh, one way or the other, um, we're going to be doing that. So, we'll get back to you on the details of it. But um, it, the idea is we're going to need to leverage federal partners because um, for a variety of reasons. Agreed. All right. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your warm welcome and, and really from the incredibly warm welcome I've received from all my colleagues and the staff. I've been really gratified by the good wishes and support that I've gotten. Uh, really happy to be here and, and hit the ground running. So thank you for the warm welcome to everyone from everyone. Uh, and I guess, Mr. Levine, I'll continue the chorus of appreciation uh, and thank you for a, a very well done presentation today and a very well done draft. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in your new position and if today's any indication, you're going to do a great job. So thank you. Uh, and of course, thank you to, I know, uh, all the staff work that goes behind these documents. So you know who I'm talking to out there and I appreciate all of you very much. Uh, so there have been a lot of thoughtful questions, so I, uh, I think I'm going to spend most of my time providing a couple of comments and maybe a question or two. Uh, I think I'd like to start with saying what I liked about the plan, uh, which was a lot. 
I did like the shift in the focus of the first two priorities to um, enforcement and prevention. Uh, I, I think that was an important change. I agree with Commissioner Chanka. I like the focus on civil penalties and deterrence. Uh, I also was um, very impressed by the focus on the disproportionate impact of hazards on certain populations, and I was particularly happy to see that woven throughout the whole document and not just confined to one area. I think that was really important. Like the uh, emphasis on improving data and recall effectiveness, and I also like the uh, um, uh, emphasis on increasing collaboration with state and local entities. So I think all of those things are good things, and I was happy to see them. Uh, there is one area, and I think I'm going to be pulling on a little bit of a thread that uh, Commissioner Trumka just talked about that I thought perhaps didn't receive enough attention, uh, and that would be chronic hazards. Uh, and I'd like to ask you about that and ask you to comment on that, and whether you agree with that characterization or just how you thought about, how the staff thought about incorporating chronic hazards and, and in particular, what we were going to be doing about chronic hazards. Um, because I would note on the, where they, where it was referenced in the document, you know, page seven and 10, there was a focus on, on identifying, researching and informing the public about chemical and chronic hazards, which is really important. I agree. And then, uh, the initiatives uh, on page 10, we again say, we're going to identify, evaluate, acquire, and integrate data sources pertaining to chronic hazards. But I, I frankly think there was the address part that was a little bit missing. This is a four year plan. Uh, and I just want to ask you to comment on that. Well, I, I mean, so thank you for the question. And before I even get to that, thank really looking forward to the opportunity of working uh, with you in, in this new role that I'm in and, and this new role that you're in. So um, thank you for your kind words. Um, I think specifically with regard to uh, chronic hazards, I mean, they're clearly going to be a key focus going forward. Um, you know, there's a variety of different ways we have historically, and I think continue to plan to try and get after chronic hazards, um, whether that be uh, from a standards perspective, from a, a, um, whether it be mandatory or voluntary, whether that be an information education campaigns. And I think most importantly, from that research perspective, now the, the address piece um, only comes after that last one, right? As you know, the, the, the research, and I think what we have historically struggled with and probably will continue to is, is identifying um, uh, the available resources to determine how we can act um, on given uh, chronic hazards, particularly in a, in a chemical kind of uh, circumstance. But there's no, to the extent uh, there's an impression that the idea is just to identify and walk away, I certainly think that that's not the the intent uh, of of the plan. Um, so maybe you know we need to, to make sure that we are identifying within the plan areas that be clear we're going to address um, where we're going to go after uh, items. But I think once I, I think what's a little bit different about chronic hazards is that once we've identified. Um, the hazard and the approach, um, then in many ways they become like any other hazard and we then move over into the, how we address it from, from an enforcement perspective. Um, but the identifying is obviously much harder than the chronic hazard circumstance. And I think hence the, the, the larger emphasis on that identification, but um, you know, we'll continue to make sure it's a key focus. And if we need to make sure that that language is clearer, um, we're gonna do that and, and you know, but if we think about, you know, think about phthalates and how long that's taken, that was a statutory uh, construct. Um, you know, it sometimes can take a long time, um, but we're not letting them go. No, I think you make a great point about phthalates and lead. I think the agency has done a tremendous job on those uh, uh, two items. And I, I think we can do, we can expand that portfolio in terms of taking action. And so I would just encourage that. Uh, the second question I had uh, has to do with the Appendix A uh, and the external factors that you identified. And I just sort of would uh, like to ask you about those factors and particularly you just alluded to it, uh, resources and how that affected the development of the strategic plan. Were there areas that uh, you all considered and just left out altogether just because of the reality of the limited resources that we face? 
Um, I, I don't think that there was a, a, a sort of entire category um, that we left on the floor. Uh, I will say, and that's sort of part of the purpose of having an external factors list uh, or discussion is that there are things in the plan that aren't necessarily funded uh, as robustly or maybe even in a in, in realistic way um, because of our limited funding. So I think the plan covers um, is, is realistic, but it probably leans on the aspirational side with respect to available resources. And, and I think uh, you'll note throughout the plan where we talk about some of the challenges uh, involved um, uh, in terms of, of achieving um, the, the goals. Uh, and some of them really do go to resources. And I mean, chronic hazard is a perfect example of that, uh, where in terms of having the ability to spend uh, the money to to conduct the research, to to get to answers, to then get to address uh, those. You know, some of those are have not even traditionally been in our baseline appropriation uh, in terms of the the dollar figure that we're getting back from Congress. So I think the if if you go before Appendix A. Uh, I think that it covers what we're what, what we think needs to be covered to uh, fulfill our statutory uh, mandate. However, uh, I think it's a recognition of of the challenges, most primarily resource, uh, but some of them, you know, on the science um, that we are facing. So, if we had unlimited resources, would would this document look very much different, or it's a matter of degree? I like imagining a world with unlimited resources. Um, I think it would be more of degree. I mean, I don't know that we've ever contemplated a strategic plan with unlimited resources. I think we try and be more or less realistic, um, but I think it would be more of degree. I mean, I think the the staff real realistically tried to tries to all the time um, scope out the you know the the areas of consumer product hazards. Um, based on what we can address and sort of filtered through an analysis of the most uh, risky um, consumer product hazards. Uh, if, if we, but as I noted, since the plan doesn't list specific product hazards, uh, we would just get to do more and more and more uh, as we work down through that, that risk scale list uh, with greater resources. Um, but it's certainly an ambitious uh, concept uh, that that is captured in the plan and unlimited resources would allow us to fulfill it all and maybe even more. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, just one other on the key measures and I could have missed it. So apologies if I did. Um, given the new focus or increased focus, renewed focus on civil penalties and deterrence. Um, is there a key measure on that topic? Um, I know it's hard to do, but it, I'm just wondering if there is one. I, as I say, I may have missed it. I don't want to misspeak. I don't. I know one of the things we added, for example, was um, uh, the measure including uh, that notice of um, of hazards being issued, where previously we hadn't really made that uh, part of a, of a measurable. Um, but I. Don't believe, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I don't believe that there's a specific key measure tied to civil penalties, um, in part because some of that is is, uh, is going to be really variable from year to year. Um, ideally, we live in a world where we don't need civil penalties, uh, and there may be years where there's significantly more of them, um, but there's nothing right on that point. I think we tried to capture more of the activity that would sort of lead up uh, to to that circumstance. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am out of time. And again, thank you for a great presentation and all the staff uh, work that went into it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I would ask my fellow commissioners if uh, they would like another round of questions. Getting a yes from Commissioner Trumpka. So I will go in order then and start with Commissioner Biacco. Did you have additional questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I just have two follow ups from uh, Commissioner Boyle's uh, points and questions. 
Um, I think that one of the uh, having a key measure for civil penalties would be very difficult. I mean, you can't find conduct that doesn't exist. So I would be interested in, in hearing uh, some of the other potential options, I guess, um, on, on any type of measurement under that category. And I really, really liked um, Commissioner Boyle's question about if you had unlimited resources, you know, would the document look differently? I think that's a great place to start um, when we're doing these types of strategic plans. I mean, if you had unlimited resources, and believe me, I think about it every day, uh, unlimited resources, what, you know, jot down what you would really like to have and then, you know, take out things that you just can't, but it would, it would set up goals for us to work for or to seek funding for as we go along. Because I can think of a lot of things that we should be including in the strategic plan, but we don't for lack of, uh, we just don't have the ability to implement them. Uh, but I, I like the concept of start from having you know unlimited resources, what we would like to have. And, and there are things I think that the commission can do with that information. So thank you for that point. I think it was a very good one. And for now, I don't have any additional questions. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Feldman, did you have additional questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I appreciate the discussion. Uh, at this point, I do not have additional questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Tromka. Thank you. And, and let me follow up on that point that that um, Commissioner Biacco and Commissioner Boyle made there about the unlimited funds. You know, I think what we could do with that, as we started thinking through those things that don't get funded, if we could point to Congress and say, "You cost." 5,000 lives this year that we otherwise would have saved with appropriate spending. Uh, that would be super useful next year when we go into appropriations. So it could be, it could be a good exercise. Um, but so is it possible to put the strategic plan document up on the screen? Cause I have questions about uh, specific language in the key performance measures in appendix D and it'd be helpful to, to have that up there while we go through this. I don't know that. Uh, I'm sure our IT folks have a Yeah, uh, Cynthia's working on that now. Yeah, I mean, we well, have the, well, no, we have, this is the slide deck. I think what Commissioner Trump is looking for is the, um, the plan itself, uh, which I don't think we pre, I don't think somebody, we have. Somebody just, um, I think Dan just emailed uh, a PDF of it. No, 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 that was the PowerPoint, Never mind. Uh, but yeah, we have so this the PowerPoint, PowerPoint is, so we should be able to share it. Document. But, I think it'd be useful, but I can get started without it and read that while we're pulling that up, but I would really appreciate it. I think it'd be much more useful to go through if we had it up on screen. Um, so strategic objective 1.2, uh, there are multiple performance measures within each one, but, but I'm talking about the first measure there, the percentage of firms that are engaged with a timely establishment inspection after being identified as a repeat offender. Can you explain what that measure means? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So the um, I, so there, there's different pieces of this. Obviously, the percentage piece goes to you know the specific um, year over year, uh, as we discussed, um, how we measure, you know, how, how we're looking to measure that, um, and, you know, and that, and that could change on an annualized basis. Um, the the goal here being, particularly when we're talking about um, in the import context, in the import surveillance context, um, quite often repeat offenders um, are, are likely to repeat again. Um, and so are we, it is, it is an acknowledgement of the need or the, um, the conclusion, uh, again, based on limited resources and can't inspect everyone all the time, where do we focus our uh, enforcement efforts um, and one of the things we, we choose to focus on is, is in the area of repeat offenders. Are we able to in a timely fashion, which is going to vary depending on the context of the case involved, um, make sure we are conducting that, that establishment on, on premises inspection. Um, so it's, it's, it's an acknowledgement of best practice that, that has previously existed, um, but an attempt to uh, raise the importance of this activity, as well as note, um, it's not just important that we're doing inspections in timely fashion or in establishment inspections, but that repeat offender um, group is um, going to get that special attention um, and, and is, is 
effective and efficient of way as possible. So I think it's, it's mainly raising something we're already doing and making it at a, um, a goal in and of itself, a performance measure in and of itself. The, the concept sounds like something I entirely agree with. I just don't understand what we're talking about. The, you, you mentioned import. Are we doing establishment inspections at foreign manufacturing facilities? I mean, what, what establishment are we inspecting and for what violations? So, no, so let, let's start with, we are not doing them at, at you know, our jurisdiction does not um, extend uh, in that way to, to inspect uh, in, in that fashion. This would be in inspecting uh, the establishments of importers uh, uh, upon, you know, their having uh, received imported goods. Got it. Yeah. Um, all right. So a strategic objective 1.2, the second measure within that, and, and that is the number of voluntary standards activities in which CPSC actively participates. That doesn't seem like a measure that has any variability. I mean, don't, don't we set the number and identify the exact voluntary standards that staff will participate in in the operating plan each year? Yes, but it changes so, on an annual basis. Well, uh, it, it, the number rephrase, might change, but unless there's, it, it, the number changes, but but this doesn't set a number. So if the operating plan said, let's do 80 this year, and here's the 80, unless staff disregarded that instruction in the operating plan, this would always be 100%. So does it still make sense as a performance measure if it can't be anything but 100%? I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand. I mean, the, the commission could set a number that staff for a variety of reasons didn't meet, uh, met or exceeded. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding the question. I'm asking why we're setting a performance measure in the strategic plan when in the operating plan each year, we do give the exact number and the exact specific oh. voluntary standards. Sure. It seems unnecessary to have a performance measure that's so unlikely to not be hit it makes more sense to just keep it each year in the operating plan, doesn't it? Sure. So, um, I believe the answer again, if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, is that the, the, the measures that are in the operating plan are, are, uh, are tied back to the strategic plan. Um, so because it's, because it's here, uh, in the, in the strategic plan, it's, it's going to be in the operating plan, but what that level is, is, is going to be set. On that annual basis, but again, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I hear what you're saying in that. Well, it could be met depending on um, you know, what that level set is. But the reason that it's uh, that it's here is because it's part of what we do every year. Uh, but this doesn't uh, the, the existence of the measure in the in the strategic plan doesn't have any influence on what that level setting is uh, by the commission. It could be the same. Well, as the let me ask that a little bit differently. We could put it in the operating plan every year without having this as a key performance measure in the strategic plan. Yes. Um, yeah, I, be I believe that's accurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary to have this 1, since we do set this 1 specifically each year in the operating plan. I, I, I think that 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 is accurate. I think, um. I would note. It, the overwhelming, and, and I, I think all of these wind up in the operating plan. It is it's certainly accurate that you can always add things to the operating plan. Um, but it's true for for anything. Anything in here that's a number um, also maybe falls in that same category. But yes, it, it doesn't have to be uh, required. Here. And this is a, a more general question, same topic about voluntary standards, but. I just want to say, I mean, I'm sure you agree that it makes sense to evaluate participation in voluntary standards on a case by case basis, instead of something more like an across the board strategy of always seeking a voluntary standard before uh, we begin rulemaking. Is that fair? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question because some constructs uh, were required to by law, others were not. Um, so, but I would say, yeah, as a general matter, we should do everything on a basis and where we're doing some analysis on a case by case basis, unless, you know, mandated by Congress. I, I appreciate that. And I think the mandate is if a voluntary standard exists that takes care of the problem, we can't do rulemaking. So if it doesn't, we can do rulemaking. adequately adequately addresses. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so in strategic objective 1.2, the 4th measure, 
recalls per billion dollars in consumer product imports for top 50 import sources, countries for administrative areas. Um, can you unpack what that one means? Sure. So this is a um, sort of th this is one of those examples of something that involves multiple offices. Um, obviously, our import surveillance, but also our international programs. Uh, in terms of um, a a measurement, I mean, it sort of in some ways it's it, it, it is a um, a way to determine a metric for what the dollar value is uh, of what we're recalling. Um, not just sort of from around the world, from the 185 plus countries, um, but sort of a, a way to distinguish um, the the the, uh, the the larger group. Uh, the the top 50 gives us a sense of sort of where the majority of, of the issues are. It's a it, I'm, I'm saying it poorly. It's basically it's a relative measure uh, to allow us to sort of look at top importing countries. Uh, and the recalls, and it allows us to sort of track on an annualized basis, um, sort of that relativity. So, as we set this goal each year in the operating plans, uh, is our goal achieved by more recalls per billion or less recalls per billion? Well, the goal, I mean, the goal would be. I mean, the goal. <laughs> To reach the goal, we have to reach the goal. So I'm not. I'm not sure. You know, so depending on where well, we set. But what I mean is, if you set the goal at 20 recalls per billion dollars from these groups, is 19 mm -hmm. good or is 21 good? Which side are we trying to get to? Well, I mean, I, again, because it's a relative measure, I think what it's mainly giving us is data on those top 50 company countries, um, and it helps us determine where to focus our energies. Uh, and, and resources, but I think it all depends on sort of how one chooses to look at recalls. Is, is the goal to be fewer recalls because that lets us know that we're doing better because there are fewer violative things in the world, or is the goal more um, because we know that there's so many out there and we should be uh, making sure our numbers are always going up? I think the value of, of the metric is actually just allowing us to target. Okay. I mean, it's a key performance measure, which means we're going to be setting a percentage or setting a number in the operating plan, and we have to know whether going higher or lower is what we're trying to do. Well, but that's where the target is. I, I thought you were asking, do we prefer to be under the target or over the target? Well, you know, we want to be over the target. I, mean, I think so the we want more recalls per billion. We want, again, it's, it is a relative. It's a relative. Um, Effort that allows us to, um, I, I, I guess I'm just not, maybe I, I need to sort of go back, um, but our current goal is less than 0.33 per billion, if that helps. So ideally, we want to get that, that does help. Yeah. So yeah. we're trying to lower, the, okay. Uh, my time has expired, um, but maybe we can finish this up later just to make sure I understand. I, I have more questions, yeah. but I'll wait for another round. Yeah. So sorry, I, I, I should have just told you the number. That would have made life a lot easier. My, my, my. Thank you, Commissioner Trumpka. So, just to be clear, you want another round of questions? Yes, please. Uh, com uh, Commissioner Boyle, do you have questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, less a question than just a comment. Uh, to thank you to Commissioner Biaco. I very much appreciate her comments. Uh, I agree, especially on the performance measures for penalties. That might not be something uh, we could actually do but i do think it's worth looking at since we're saying that it's something that we're prioritizing it could be something along the lines of timeliness of the number of cases that we've evaluated on whether a, a civil penalty uh, is warranted i mean there there are probably other better ideas but that just popped into my head so uh, but i agree it's very difficult uh, but i do think um, it's something that we are prioritizing and if it were possible to uh, put a measure in for that work to reflect this, that work that people are doing uh, would be something worthwhile. So, other than that, I don't have any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Can start another round then. Uh, so, the Commissioner Trump can want some. I'll start with myself. And, you know, I think 
I've been advocating for more resources for the, for the agency for a long time. I think the agency is significantly underfunded and we could do a lot more with more resources. And I think all the commissioners have agreed at different times with that concept. I would worry about spending a lot of time thinking about what the world would look like on unlimited resources because if we had unlimited resources. We'd be doing so many different things from reaching out to individuals in their homes the minute they have a baby to, you know, to uh, some, uh, a tremendous more research and exploring of different, um, you know, hazards that are that are out there. So I think we need to balance that in the end of the day, that's all I'm saying. You want to be able to figure out realistically what do we do? Because we don't want staff to be thinking on uh, on ideas that, we all know we'll never reach. At the same time, strategic plans need to be forward looking. They need to be aggressive. And they need to be able to think about things that we would want to do and honestly on some levels may never achieve because we want to be able to push forward. So I agree, thinking broadly makes sense. I would just want to balance that out going forward. Um, and then with respect to the different metrics that are in there, you know, Mr. Lean, my understanding to some degree is that we have these metrics set forth in the uh, the strategic plan, and because they are in the strategic plan, they necessarily need to be um, reflected in the operating plan. Is that fair? Yes, that's bit? correct. Yeah. So while we can add additional metrics in the operating plan by having it in the strategic plan, it becomes the basis by which we will then staff necessarily will figure out what those metrics are. Is that fair? <clears throat> That's fair. And I guess I would also add, um, it's just a start. Uh, it's not to say that we are limited with our operating plan or our budget requests to only talk about the, the key performance, to only use the key performance me measures <coughs> um, that are in the strategic plan. Um, but we do start those documents uh, you know, with these key measures. Um, but I, I will also note, because it's a four and five year period, um, there have been instances historically where for, for a reason sort of where the commission determines a key measure several years after the strategic plan was written is no longer really valuable to, to the work of the commission. The commission can choose uh, to, to change that or, or, or delete it or adjust it. Um, but traditionally speaking, we start here. Uh, and then we build from there. So if it's issues like working on voluntary standards, which is part of our statute, um, that would mean that the operating plans would need to have them if it's in the strategic plan or for civil penalties. If we put something in for civil penalties, it would be necessarily included in the operating plan or other um, metrics with respect to communications or, or any other. So it's, it's really setting uh, boundaries on the staff as to what they're gonna have to consider over the next four or five years. Right. Um, that uh, appreciate that clarification. I'm going to turn to Commissioner Bianco if you have additional questions. Yes, um, I don't. I, I don't want to speak for Commissioner Trunka or Mr. Levine, but I think at least what I'm hearing is that the confusion on on the questions is that the way the um, performance measure is drafted, it, it appears to assign a specific number to a specific amount of dollars. And as I mentioned earlier with the civil penalties, if you don't have violative conduct, you can't say we're gonna have 21 recalls if there's only you know, 10 or 19 uh, that, that we uh, measure as needing to be recalled. So I think that is what I'm hearing is the confusion that it, it, at least for those performance measures, it's giving, um, you know, assigning a particular quota, if you will, or number that's causing the confusion. But more, more importantly, I, I think the point is this. We need to go back and look at some of the metric or me, uh, measurements. And uh, I think Commissioner Boyle was, was right on when she said, come up with, you know, let's think about this from a different perspective, some other ideas that would, would as, uh, serve as a strong measurement of our objectives. Because I agree with you, Mr. Levine, if, if you know, there are less recalls, we are doing our job better. Um, at least, you know, that that's the concept. So I think maybe going back and looking at some of these measure measurements, I had some uh, questions myself about the, you know, esoteric nature of them that might clear up some of the 
um, some of the confusion. Just throwing that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, turn back to Commissioner Trumka. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have no questions at this time. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Trumka. And these are going to go back to a, Appendix D. So if that document was available, uh, it would be useful to. Commissioner Trump, I believe you're muted. Uh, so, so I am. Thanks. Um, but so, so this goes back to strategic objective 2.1, the 1st measure there, uh, the percentage of cases for which a preliminary determination is made within 85 business days of the case opening. 85 business days is more like 120 calendar days and and that if 85 business days from today takes us to the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, so, what are some shorter timeline goals than the 85 day mark that we could consider for this measure? I'm sorry, commissioner, which, which goal are we talking about? Strategic objective uh, 2.1, the 1st measure within it, the 1 that starts percentage oh, okay, of cases. I got you. I, okay. I got you now. Okay. Um. And so your question is, could the could the measure be fewer days? I don't know. My 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 question presumes that the measure could be shorter. But what are some shorter timelines than eighty five business days that we could consider here? I, I just want to be clear for for this measure in particular, for this specific measure. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I believe this was actually a, a change. Already from um, from previously uh, from a previous number, uh, but I wouldn't want to speak off the cuff as to what that number might be. I mean, I think right I, the the goal is always going to be um, both getting it done quickly, but also getting it done right. Um, and so uh, you know the um, the distinction for as, as you certainly know, but for the public, right, the preliminary determinations are going to vary. Pretty dramatically uh, in terms of the, the difficulty uh, of, of the, the matter in which we're, we're examining. So, um, obviously, we can go back and sort of uh, you know, come back with, with a conversation about changing that number. And, and I also think it'd be important to understand sort of how, uh, how staff has done with respect to meeting uh, the, the goals laid out by the commission uh, for this sort of metric. In the past, um, because I think that also helps inform the question of, uh, is this the right, um, not just the right, me right measure, but the, uh, the right percentage. Okay. You know, so, so that I think that is the same as the 2018 plan for this measure. I don't think the 85 days change. Okay, um, sorry. but I was thinking, if, of, I'm sorry, I was thinking of the 90 days on the next 1. Sorry. So, so if, if you, if staff could propose some possible shorter alternatives for that 1 that we could talk about within the next week, I think that'd be great. So, I. I'm sorry. I just I just want to be clear. Shorter than 85 for this yes. specific measure. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Sure. And then strategic objective 2.1, the third measure percentage of cases for which a corrective action plan uh, is accepted or public notice of hazard is issued within 90 business days of preliminary determination. So, so this is where we've ID'd that a hazard uh, exists that we want corrected. And we're working towards a recall cap. Now, my my question is is based on this. You know, the strategic plan is a public document, and so the parties that we're negotiating caps against can see our timeline goals, and they know they have at least ninety days to get their ducks in a row before they have to agree to a cap here. Uh, and I think many see a benefit to delaying the public announcement. It gives them time to line things up and and put spin on it. You know, get their affairs in order, get things ready, uh, and and a lot of people take as much time as they can at this juncture. If they saw that our goals here were something shorter, say 30 days, they would know they had to work faster. And I think we could expect to see quicker cooperation from them, couldn't we? Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, as, as a matter of um, sort of categorizing entire panoply of different sorts of firms with which we work uh, and, and how um, they choose to approach 
uh, product safety. Uh, some are very eager and um, willing participants in the process and move uh, far quicker than others. Um, you know, we do, I think, I want to say over 200 a year uh, on average. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that we can say sort of definitively that simply uh, changing that number in any direction would distinctly influence behavior. Um, but, you know, uh, hard to know, hard to say. You know, the, the one thing that I think I learned from working at a law firm years ago was that uh, work in negotiations is gaseous. You know, whatever your end timeline is, you will expand to meet it. And, and if it's shorter, you will meet it there too. And, and so I think that a shorter timeline here would be very useful. Um, and it is a goal. You mentioned wanting to see how we've done on it. It is a goal that we've done well on in, in past years. We hit that at 75% last year. Great. Um, so uh, the next one is strategic objective 2.2. The third measure within that, the percentage of fast track cases with corrective action plans initiated within 20 business days of case opening. Uh, first question there is what does initiated mean? Um, it's, I mean, it's got an internal definition, uh, in terms of when we start the clock, uh, remember fast track cases are brought to us, uh, through the, um, now through our, through our portal with businesses, uh, in terms of, uh, companies bringing to us a, a product for which they want to conduct a recall. Uh, and while the portal has certainly streamlined that process, it has not necessarily meant that everything we get is complete enough to initiate to start let's let's not use the word in here to define it to uh to begin the process of conducting that recall so um initiate would be at the moment that staff determines we have received sufficient information uh, from the firm um to uh to begin the process and also includes uh a manufacturer agreement to or, or a Telling us, I should say, that they have stopped sale of the product. So okay. it's sort of a, it's a twofold process. Okay, and this is one that we've done like unusually well on in meeting this goal. So 2018, 96 percent. 2019, 97 percent. 2020, 97 percent. And 2021, 95 percent. And in in the the most recent budget, we have our goal set down at 90 percent. But in order to keep pushing ourselves forward here, do you think we'd be better suited to lower the number of days from 20 to increase our target to above 97% or to do both? I would need to go back and, and look at the numbers behind the numbers. Um, and also note it's again, like everything, unfortunately, we have to balance is where are we going to um, put our resources in terms of um, these activities? So, I, you know, I, I again, wouldn't want to answer off the cuff, I think. Um, we would need to examine more carefully um, the what a change would mean uh, and which would effectuate the end purpose, which is removing uh, hazardous products from consumers. Okay, uh, strategic objective 2.2, and actually this one's used throughout the document. We, what we previously uh, in the 2018 plan had called recall effectiveness uh, is now called recall response in this draft. Do those terms have different meanings and, and why did we move to this phrase and what are any differences that exist there? Sure, so they're, they're definitely both used throughout the document. Recall effectiveness remains uh, in the document. Uh, I, I, though uh, it has changed, the language specifically in this measure did change from effectiveness to response. Um, so I think at a, at a, at a, at a micro level, um, when we're talking about response, it is literally the, um, the measurement of how uh, many consumers um, uh, respond to, to a recall uh, in a way that's measurable. And so when we're talking about a, a remedy, a repair, or a replacement, uh, how many consumers are taking advantage uh, of that, um, that offer uh, from a manufacturer. With respect to um, uh, effectiveness, that's sort of a broader concept. Uh, that may include um, other more difficult to measure or more um, uh, yeah more difficult to measure uh, pieces of of the recall puzzle um, and so you know the, the classic example of course being uh, it's very hard to count someone throwing out a recalled product uh, as part of the response that's certainly a response 
Um, but it's very hard for us to measure that. Uh, but fewer of those products in consumers' homes uh, would go to the effectiveness of the recall. And so, you know, we continue to explore ways to better effectuate recalls uh, and better measure how effective we are at those recalls. Um, but it's, it's as, as you probably are aware, not just for CPSC, but for all agencies involved in the recalls, it's very hard to measure that um, end effectiveness beyond exactly what consumers are, are reporting back. So, so I guess my only question there, and that all makes sense to me, I, I agree with that. Um, but the number that we've tracked over time in like the last budget document that has year over year was recall effectiveness. Can we put this number next to that side by side and have it be an apples to apples, or are we starting with a new measure? I would have to get back to you on, on exactly sort of, um, again, everything that went into that number versus uh, how we're, we're planning on uh, calculating this response uh, for, um, for the measure under uh, 1 point or 2.2. Um, I would note, I mean, we are continuing to look for uh, ways of being broader to examine just the correction rate, uh, whether it be consumer interaction with, um, with messaging about recalls. Uh, is one way of sort of thinking about it. But, uh, you know, I think we'll have to get back to you. I think historically speaking, we have been measuring response rate. Um, and I think uh, it has historically been called effectiveness. Um, and so we're trying to be a little bit more precise about what we are capturing and a little more creative in how we can better um, measure and account for uh, what it is that we are doing when we conduct. You know, we, we recalled 43 million units of consumer products last year. Um, it's very hard to measure um, what happens in each of those instances. I think that'll make sense. And, and if, if we're being more precise and can still compare it across the timeline, that's a great idea to do. So it works for me. I, I'm out of time again, still have some more questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not have any more questions. Uh, Commissioner Bianco, do you have more questions? Um, I do not have any more questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, do you have any questions? I do not. I de defer uh, uh, back to Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. Commissioner Trumka? Thank you all. I appreciate the indulgence. Um, so, uh, Mr. Levy, would you see value in adding a key performance measure for the percentage of recalled products for which consumers are entitled to a full refund or replacement. Um, you mean as a standalone measure? I would be adding a new key, uh, key performance measure. Um, Potentially, but potentially not. I mean, I think the, the larger question is, um, again, our goal is to get the dangerous products out of consumers' hands. So I think we'd want to be sure that um, measuring you know, different pieces of the recall remedy, repair, uh, recall replace repair paradigm um, helps us accomplish that goal. So, I, you know, off the top of our head, I, you know, we need to go back and look um, because, again, uh, it's going to vary pretty dramatically. A washing machine that's going to be a lot more important uh, in terms of some of those determinations uh, than maybe a fidget spinner. So, you know, it, I think it's going to vary. So, I'm not sure that, it, that just a pure number in that way would would provide a lot of information. Okay, uh, strategic objective two point four. The percentage of overdue notification notices sent to firms within 10 days of determining the firm's monthly progress report is 30 calendar days overdue. And this one is a new measure, I believe. Um, Correct. Do we, do we currently send notifications like this and, and at what rate? Um, I would need to get back to you on a rate. Um, we certainly do send um, do. Sorry, I'm reading. Uh, we do, we do send overdue notifications. Um, I think what's um, what's now we're we're two things that are happening here. We're we are raising the the emphasis on making sure that firms are um, 
are meeting their obligations under the um, under the monthly progress report uh, requirement that they uh, agreed to with us, uh, and we are um, wanting to in, do a better job of measuring how frequently we are doing that. Uh, but uh, at this time, sort of our, our process is to make sure we are notifying when they miss uh, when they miss it. Uh, what we're trying to do here, to your point, uh, is to accelerate. That process um, and make sure that um, we are getting that information because that's another piece of valuable information uh, available to consumers um, that uh, we want to make sure is out there in terms of how successful individual firms are at living up to their obligations in a recall process. So, so on this one, I mean, we've got monthly progress reports, but baked in on these timelines are. 30 days late and another 10 plus transmit time. So over 40 days, 40 or, or more days before we're sending this letter, which is more than a month on monthly progress reports. So it, did we consider shorter timelines and or can we consider shorter timelines before these triggers are kicked? Well, I, I'm not sure that I agree with how you're counting the calendar days, right? So they're not late. Uh, you know, we have to determine when they're late. So, you know, they have that that extra they have that month to report going backwards. Remember, it's always a backwards looking metric. Um, but the goal here is to uh, make sure we regularly and promptly get these notifications out um, because it's it's a real point of emphasis of making sure that we're acquiring this information uh, and providing it to the public as quickly as possible. And we can't do that. You know, we don't have immediate access to what the firms are are, um, uh, are receiving in terms of that recall response rate. Uh, so we need to get it from them and we're going to more regularly and um, in a more timely fashion than we have previously, make sure we get that information to them, a letter to them. On uh, strategic objective 4.4, uh, the fourth measure, um, percentage of critical vulnerabilities addressed if U.S. CERT uh, are addressed from U.S. or within three business days. So, if U.S. CERT declares something a critical vulnerability, that's that's the highest level vulnerability. It's also public, and so that's the day, or if not before that day, that that bad actors can start trying to exploit a vulnerability. Um, and you know, three days sounds pretty good, but there could be systems within our system that hold particularly sensitive, personally identifiable information. Have we considered risk ranking our systems within that where we'd have to maybe address certain systems that have a critical vulnerability within 24 hours instead of those three days, things that would particularly sensitive PII? Sure. So while the goal is public, um, I'm not sure that we want to have this conversation in public. Understood. Um, in the 2018 strategic plan, there was a strategic initiative to regularly publish electronic submissions of progress reports from recalling firms. And I, I don't think that appears in this strategic plan, um, but I asked about something like that before and you told me I, that I might've just missed it. So I wanted to see if it was somewhere else or, or if there was a reason it wasn't in here. I'm sorry, can you, can because I was looking in this plan for it and you're saying it's not here. What, what no, we, what well, about? I don't see it, but, but in the 2018 strategic plan, there was a strategic mm -hmm. initiative and it was to quote, regularly publish electronic submissions of progress reports from recalling firms. Right, I, I think that is captured by the monthly progress report. I think that's what we're talking about. So I think it's a reformatting uh, of that with a with an increase on making sure we're getting the information more quickly. Like that's I what the electronic think it might be slightly different. This this is saying we need to publish their actual progress reports. That was the 2018 goal, uh, and I don't see that part reflected in the current. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to get back to you. I think the goal of publishing monthly progress reports in a way that is usable for consumers is uh, also uh, putting it in a single format and allowing uh, consumers to compare one manufacturer's ability to undertake recalls in a way uh, against others. Um, but we can we can take a look at, um, at exactly what changed there. Uh, but I'd also note the resources involved in. Um, uh, in publishing that sort of thing, I think our goal was to actually acquire the data to get it published in the monthly progress report, not to necessarily publish the actual uh, 
piece of, of paper submitted or, or electronic data submitted from the manufacturer in part um, because then we might have to wrestle with confidential business information questions. So I, I think that's, again, the concept is captured in, in the NPRs, but uh, we'll circle back. I will ask my final question of the day to everyone's um, relief, I imagine. But uh, I think overall, if someone asked whether this agency is successful at protecting consumers, we all, of course, know the answer is yes. But but I don't see where we've given ourselves a way of demonstrating that to the public. And the strategic planning process seems like the perfect vehicle for creating something like that, something to measure our success, setting quantifiable goals for the next four years, and then to see how we've stacked up. So if we could estimate the number of deaths averted by individual CPSC actions or, or in injuries averted as well, wouldn't that show the public how successful we've been with the actions that we do that we do take? Uh, well, it would it would certainly um, it would certainly be a uh, something we'd be proud to share uh, with the public. I, I think there would be um, extraordinary difficulty in sort of doing that in a way that um, factors in things like population growth, economic changes. Um, Specifically attributing exactly where we are, uh, exactly you know how our action influenced a specific outcome, um, and then there's always the concern about aggrandizing the agency just for the sake of aggrandizing it. But I, you know, I think certainly on behalf of the staff, anyway, we can sort of make sure that we are doing a good job of communicating uh, the life-saving work that happens here every day is something we we want to do. But I also think um, you know we're always sort of on to that next. What's that next hazard we can address uh, and and not wanting to sort of get into uh, trying to pick uh, one specific action equal one specific life saved uh, at, at some sort of macro level, I think is, is a difficult task. Um, but I know there, there are think tanks out there that have tried to do it. So maybe we should look to previously published information on that. Well, I think we should, and I think we should should include something along these lines uh, in the strategic plan and going forward with with each rulemaking that we undertake. So. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone's patience uh, as as I walk through this. So thank you, and thank you for all the work that went into the document, obviously, and and uh, to preparing for today. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle, do you have additional questions? I do not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, with that, I want to, unless uh, did any other commissioner have one other round? Okay. Um, I want to thank the staff for this form the briefing. I want to thank the commissioners for the active participation. Obviously, this is a draft that the commission will look to um, consider in the coming weeks as to um, what should be put out for the um, public comment. So, um, I have two weeks to be able to discuss that, look to see what changes in the draft are appropriate, and then seek public comment because I think that is extremely important step in, in this process. And then once public comments are in, obviously, um, as uh, Mr. Lillian laid out, um, there is a process of, of some time um, for us before it's finalized and be able to put together um, strong strategic plan going forward. So we will convene two weeks to vote on putting the plan out for public comment. Um, and um, I thank again staff and the commissioners for all their work in getting this right. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.